Hello, welcome to the Word of Faith Fellowship program. My name is Gerald Sutherland. I'm the Associate Pastor of Word of Faith Fellowship. And whether you're watching on uh, the internet or our church website or listening on WCAB radio, so happy to have you today. And you know, I know there's a lot of bad news going on around the world now, but I didn't come to bring you bad news. I came to bring you good news. And the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And I'm so grateful today to be a part of the family of God and to be able to come and share the truth with you. What God's put on my heart to share with you today, it may be one of the most important subjects that we find in the Bible. It's mentioned many, many times. And uh, I'm persuaded to believe that it's perhaps one of the things that Jesus was speaking of when he told his disciples, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And there are many keys, many principles that God's given us, but I believe that one of those keys is the key or the principle of humility. And so I'm going to be sharing with you today many scriptures from the Bible, from the Word of God, about what God has to say about humility. I'm going to begin by reading from Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bible, turn there with me, Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 3. Paul said, By the Spirit of God, do nothing from factional motives, through contentiousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends, or prompted by conceit and empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, and I want to emphasize that phrase, in the true spirit of humility or lowliness of mind, let each regard the others as better than and superior to himself, thinking more highly of one another than you do of yourselves. Now, again, I'm going to go back to that phrase, the true spirit of humility. If there is a true spirit of humility, there must obviously be a false spirit of humility. And that false spirit of humility may appear on the surface to be the humility that God ascribes to, but it's not. It may seem like someone is real humble because of their straightened circumstances, whatever they may be going through in their lives, wherever they may uh, find themselves. But true humility comes only from God. And it's not an outward show. It's an inward working of the Spirit, a divine unction in the Spirit. I'm going to read on. He said, Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but also each of the for the interests of others. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And then the last phrase of that passage says, Let him, meaning Jesus, let him be your example in humility. And that's what I want to be sharing with you today. God wants you and I to be to follow after the example that Jesus set for us, that example of humility. There are many things that I'm going to be sharing with you today will, that will show us without a shadow of a doubt that walking in humility before God is such a powerful thing, such a valuable thing in the kingdom. I want to go now to John chapter 5, the Gospel of John chapter 5 and verse 30, because Jesus in John 5, 30 gives us a perfect description of what it means to live and walk in humility before God. So again, if you have your Bibles, go with me there, John 5, verse 30. Jesus said, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I'm taught by God as a, and as I get his orders. One, one of the ways we can measure ourselves, whether we're walking in humility or not, is do we think we have a hold of doing anything we want to do, and we'll, we're always doing it right. We don't have to be concerned about that because, after all, you know, we... We've been this way, we've been that way, I've been to this college, I've got this degree, 
uh, you know, I've done these things in my life, and so I'm, you know, I'm self-sufficient. Well, that's a good indication. It's a strong indication that you're not walking in humility. Because one who is truly humble, as Jesus was and is, is one that knows and announces, makes it very clear by what he says, that he, can, he depends on himself for nothing. Because everything that he needs, he needs, it needs for it to come from God. The Apostle Paul said in the book of in Philippians again, he said, I am sufficient only in Christ Jesus. It's only in him that I have sufficiency. I'm going to read on now what Jesus said. He said, I can of my own self do nothing, only as I'm taught by God, as I get his orders, even as I hear, Jesus said. I judge. I decide as I'm bidden to decide by God, in other words. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, it's just, it's righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. Now, there's another indicator of whether we're living in humility and true and the true spirit of humility. And that is, do we make our own judgments, our own decisions? Are we seeking our own will, our own desire? Then we're not walking in true godly humility. It's only when we're seeking God for everything. The Bible says in the book of Acts, it's in him that we live, that we move, and that we have our being. And being totally and dependent, totally dependent rather upon him. That's when we're walking in true humility. Jesus said, I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself. Isn't that powerful? Don't you want to live that way? That's what I want to live like. Having no desire to do what's pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. That is the true spirit of humility. And that's what God was saying through the apostle, that he wants us to emulate, wants us to be like, is to follow the example of humility that Jesus set and sets before us all the time if we listen to his voice. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 8 also. Here's a good example of a man who was walking in humility. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 says, As Jesus went into Capernaum, a centurion came up to him, begging him and saying, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house paralyzed and distressed with intense pains. And Jesus said to him, I will come and restore him. But the centurion replied to him, Lord, I'm not worthy or fit to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant boy will be cured. Here's a man who cared about his servant boy. Uh, and yet he realized there was nothing he could do to cure his servant boy. That's why he came to Jesus. And the more we walk in humility before God and before Jesus, the more we turn to him and the answers that we need so many times through every day of our lives, we need answers. We need you know, solutions to problems. And, and how often we try everything we can possibly try, and then maybe we turn to God and ask God. That's not the way God intended it. He wants us to come to him first. Seek first, Jesus said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. The, the man also acknowledged that he, was, he had no value in himself, even though he was a Roman centurion, he had great authority, and yet he said, I know that I don't have any authority of my own. He said, for I also am a man subject to authority. In other words, I'm under authority, therefore I have authority. That's a key, being humble enough to walk and live in humility, submitted to the authority of God and to those that God has put in our lives. He said, I'm also a man subject to authority with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard him, 
he marveled and said to those who followed him, who adhered to him, conformed to his example in living, and if need be in dying also, I tell you truly, Jesus said, I've not found so much faith as this anywhere, not even in Israel. Why did he have such faith? It was because he knew that there was absolutely nothing he could do in the natural, nothing he could do to change the condition of his servant. But he knew that Jesus could and he would if he would believe him. And he came in humility. Yes, he came in faith. And there is no faith apart from humility and walking humble before God. When Jesus heard him, he marveled at him. And he, kept on, he went on and he said, I tell you, many will come from east and west and will sit down at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons and the heirs of the kingdom will be driven out into the darkness outside where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. And then he said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the, and the servant boy was restored to health at that very moment. Out of the humility that God had worked in this man's heart, he was able to come in that humility before Jesus, asking for Jesus to cure his servant boy. And Jesus responded to that, and he healed the boy instantly. Over in the book of Proverbs, we read a lot about humility. I, read, I want to read just a few of those verses. Pro, first of all, Proverbs 22, verse 4. The reward of humility and the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Did you get that? Did you hear that promise from God? The reward of humility and the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. And in chapter 29, verse 23 of Proverbs, it says, A man's pride will bring him low, but he who is of a humble spirit will obtain honor. That's wonderful. That's the way God wants us to live. A man's pride will bring him low, but he who is of a humble spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs 11 Verse 2 says, when swelling and pride come, then emptiness and shame come also. But with the humble, with those who are lowly, who have been pruned or chiseled by trial and renounce self, are skillful and godly wisdom and soundness. We all need that, don't we? Godly, skillful wisdom and soundness. And that comes by the, the fear of the Lord, knowing that God is God and that God will do what God says he will do and being humble before him. Proverbs 15, verse 33 says, the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord brings instruction in wisdom and humility comes before honor. Once again, the promise of God about humility. In Psalm 138, verse six, the scripture says, for though the Lord is high, Yet has he respect to the lowly, bringing them into fellowship with him. The lowly meaning, of course, those that are humble, bringing them into fellowship with him. But the proud and haughty he knows and recognizes only at a distance. Psalm 147, verse 6. The Lord lifts up the humble and the downtrodden. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Psalm 149, verse 4 says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. I'm so grateful for that. He takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. We want to be beautified with God's salvation, don't we? And that comes by being humble before him, acknowledging that God is God and that God can be trusted when we rely on him, when we turn to him, recognizing that we have no ability whatsoever of our own, but our dependence is entirely on him. In Luke chapter 18, the scripture tells us in verse 10, two men went up into the temple, the enclosure to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously and began to pray thus before and with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of men, 
extortioners, robbers, swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life, adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. Sounds like humility, doesn't it? But it's not. It's that false spirit of humility that makes it sound good, but it's not real. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I gain. But the tax collector, merely standing at a distance, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his breast, saying, O oh God, be favorable. Be gracious, be merciful to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. A man who acknowledges his need for God. A man who acknowledges that there's sin in his life and he needs God to remove that sin from him. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified, forgiven and made upright and in right standing with God rather than the other man. Because this man had the true spirit of humility. The other man was trying to seduce God through his false humility. All right, let's go on to another place. Well, let me finish that verse. Jesus said also, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. That is a spiritual law. You can't change it. I can't change it. It is a law. If you try to exalt yourself, you will be humbled. You will be brought down. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Only God can do that. That's a work of the Spirit. I want it in my life, and I'm sure some of you do too. I hope all of you do. You want that in your life to where you are humble before God, and you're humble before those around you so that they can see a true spirit of humility, not a false one. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourself what is that perfect, good and perfect and acceptable will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Now listen to verse 3. For by the grace, the unmerited favor of God given to me, I warn every one of you not to estimate and think of himself more highly than he ought, not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance. And there are many people that I've met over the years, and I'm sure you have too, who had that elevated opinion, exaggerated opinion of themselves. But to rate his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith apportioned by God to him. And then moving on to the apostle James. James chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. God said, or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking to no purpose that says the spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he has caused to dwell in us, yearns over us, and he yearns for the spirit to be welcome with a jealous love. And one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is humility. Humility before God, and that's what he wants to work in our hearts. And God wants, to, wants the, uh, the work of that spirit in us to show us how God wants all of us to live. It goes on to say, but he gives us more and more grace, power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency in all others fully. That's why he says God sets himself against the proud and the haughty. Get that. God Almighty himself sets himself in opposition to those that are proud and haughty, but he gives grace continually I like that word, continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. Are we humble enough to receive the blessings of God, the leadership of God, the correction of God when we miss it? That's what God wants us to do, to be humble before him. So be subject to God and then resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. That's good news, isn't it? That's good news. We humble ourselves before God, submit to him, then we can resist the devil and he will flee. He has no choice. It has to flee. He says, come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you're sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. 
realize that you've been disloyal, uh, wavering individuals with divided interests, and purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. And then he says something so important. As you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve. Even weep over your disloyalty. Let your laughter be turned to grief and your mirth to dejection and heartfelt shame for your sins. And then he says, humble yourselves, feeling very insignificant in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up, and he will make your lives significant. Are you listening to me today or watching on the internet or our church website? And do you realize by the, what I've been reading you from the scriptures that that humility is not worked in your life and your lives are not significant? Well, submit your heart to God today. Acknowledge your need for him. I like to do that every day. I like to start the day by reminding myself and reminding God that I need him desperately. I can do nothing apart from his leadership and apart from his guidance. The apostle Peter in chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, put it this way. Likewise, you who are younger and of lesser rank, be subject to the elders, the ministers, and the spiritual guides of the church, giving them due respect and yielding to their counsel. Clothe or apron yourselves, all of you. There's nobody exempt from this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility as the garb of a servant, so that its covering, that humility, cannot possibly be stripped from you with freedom from pride and arrogance toward one another. For God sets himself against the proud. There it is again. God sets himself against the proud, the insolent, the overbearing, the disdainful, the presumptuous, the boastful, and he opposes, frustrates, and defeats them. But he gives grace, God's grace is God's ability that's working on the inside of us to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus. It's Jesus himself working in us, causing us to think the way he thinks, to speak the way he speaks, to act the way he acts, to be a testimony of the fact that Jesus is alive and risen from the dead and he wants to live in and among his people so that the world can see that salvation is available to every human being that will but believe and trust and rely on him. And then the scripture goes on to say, Therefore humble yourselves, demote yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. In due time, he will exalt you as you humble yourself before him. That's a promise that cannot be changed. That's a promise from God. And it's one that's everlasting. And God wants to fulfill it in our lives today. And then he said, casting the whole of your care. Do you have cares in your life today? Is there something that's concerning you? Something that's bothering you? Relationship perhaps? A financial problem maybe? Or a health situation? any care at all. He said, all your anxieties, all your worries, cast them on him. All your concerns once and for all on him. For he cares for you affectionately and he cares about you watchfully. And when we humble ourselves, we come before him and we cry out to him and we say, Father, I need you so desperately. I think often of a king of Judah his name was Jehoshaphat. And Judah was surrounded by the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. And there was absolutely no way that the army of Judah would be able to stand against the armies that were facing them. But the king went before God and he said, Father, you see all of this multitude of people that are against us to destroy us. And we don't know what to do, Father, but our eyes are upon you. And God spoke, God moved, and delivered them from that attack of the enemy. And God will do it for us when we cry out and we seek him with all of our heart. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 66 and verse 1, Thus says the Lord, 
Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? And what kind can be my resting place? For all these things my hand has made. Do we recognize that? Do we recognize that every good thing that's ever come in our lives came from God? Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness, not even a shadow of turning. The good gifts come from God. Our acknowledgement of that is so important and it's so humble. For all these things, God said, my hand is made. And so all these things have come into being by and for me, says the Lord. But this is the man, now listen, this is the man to whom I will look and have regard. He who is humble and of a broken or wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. What a powerful word from God. What a powerful admonition from God for us to find at God's place in our, in our lives where we know our dependence is entirely on him for everything that we live, everything that we do, everything that we say, everything in dependence on him. Let me encourage you today. The Apostle Paul, as I read in the beginning, put it this way, let Jesus be your example in humility. Seek him with all of your heart. And let him show you how to live. We don't know how to live godly and holy apart from him. And no, no one's perfect. Jesus is. And he wants to work that perfection in my life and in your life if we allow him to. And it may begin by just simply saying, God, I have made a mess in my life and I'm desperate for a change. And I need you to change my heart, to change my life today. And that would be the beginning of a new life for you. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature, a new person. A person that's never lived this way before. Now he's living a different life. He's living in Jesus and Jesus is living in him. Remember Jesus said, I could do nothing except I hear what the Father is saying. And that's what I encourage you to do today. So grateful that you tuned in to our radio program today or watching us on the internet. I'd like to encourage you also to tune in on our church website. It's wordoffaithfellowship.org, wordoffaithfellowship.org. And if you turn to that on the internet, you can look at all of the previous programs that we've had. Uh, some of them are teaching programs like ours was today. Others of them are sharing testimonies of what God has done miraculously in their lives to bring them out of the pit of destruction, to heal their bodies, to restore their minds, to restore their families, their relationships. God wants you to be encouraged today. There's enough things out there in the world to discourage us, but we want to find out, we want to hear what God has to say because what he says always encourages us. I want you to know how much we love you and we're praying for you and we'll look forward to talking to you next time on the program. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.